Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. Exploring the unexplained. Breaking down barriers. Putting the macabre under the microscope. Dissecting the disturbing. Seeking out the sinister. Bringing you the jinkies and the jump scares. Hey guys, and welcome back to Freaky Friday. As usual, it's your hosts, Devin and Megan. Hey guys. And this week, we are going to be talking about the experience of ancient Egypt and who's who in the ancient Egypt god world. Yeah, there's lots of really weird and wonderful facts about the gods that I'm keen to dive into. And just the whole ancient Egyptian culture in general, the absolute like obsession with the whole death life and death cycle actually yeah i actually read an interesting quote that said like a lot of people say that the egyptians were obsessed with death but they were actually more obsessed with life that's the conclusion i came to after i went through everything i also i was like these people are really obsessed with death but afterwards you just realize that actually how much they're trying to grasp onto life yeah and how your life sort of continues after death exactly yeah um So the Egyptians mainly had this belief that after they died or moved on, uh, they went to this place called the Land of Two Fields. Other people called it the Field of Reeds, the Field of Offerings, the Field of Rushes. There's a lot of different uh, versions of what this is called, but they believed there was this afterlife, uh, which was a mirror image of their world, just where everything is completely ideal um, and lush and fruitful. Um, so it c- could basically be, so there's their idea of heaven. They, that's, that's pretty much what yeah. it is, yeah, I think so. And yeah, they, they, the way they, their outlook was that uh, their life on earth was only part of their journey, uh, the, of their eternal journey. Mm. Uh, things didn't end in death. I think that's how we today see things, Yeah. Um, that everything ends after death. For them, death was only sort of a transition phase Mm. and then they carried on for an everlasting joy. Yeah, which I think explains why, you know, when they were mummified and put to rest and stuff, they were given a lot of things to sort of take with them. Yeah, the, well, come to that, but yeah, the grave goods. Mm. Uh, Yeah, and yeah, I think the general outview was they were, you were born on Earth through the benevolence of the gods um, or, and deities called the Seven Hathors. Mm. And once once you were given your life, you had to decree your own fate. Um, and your soul went on to live a good li- as good a life as it could in the body that it's given. And like I said, death was only a transition onto another realm um, where if justified by the gods, you would live eternally in paradise. Mm. And yeah, I think this is why Osiris, we all know that the Egyptians had so many different gods yeah. that they worshipped, so many different things. But Osiris was one of the most honored in ancient Egypt. And that was because he opened the door to the afterlife. Oh, okay. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> there was just, I when I was researching this, there was just so much to take in that I feel like there were a lot of things I missed out on. Yeah, I agree. There is so much to take in. But the general overview was that you had to, uh, I guess a lot of people today have a similar overview. Uh, You had to earn your way to the afterlife, just like people today will believe you have to earn your way to heaven. Yeah. And you did this by doing good deeds while you were alive. The more good deeds you did, the lighter your heart became. And that was a very important factor, which we'll get to later on. But you wanted to have your heart as light as possible. Yeah. So that you could board Ra's boat and sail to the afterlife. Uh, if your heart wasn't large enough, then you were going to be stuck in your tomb forever, which is why there was probably, I think, they, they, well, they said there was so minimal crime in Egypt. Oh, really? Because nobody wanted that. There was such a terrifying fate to them, mm. being stuck in your tomb and not moving on to the afterlife, that they <laughs> did not commit crime. They just tried to do what they could to mm. keep a light heart. So that has to do with... Um I think one of their gods or goddesses dubbed the devourer of Amenti. Yes. Her name, her, his or her, her name, her name was Amit. Um, yes, Amit was a And, um, she? yeah, 
So she was apparently kind of creepy looking, had a crocodile's head, a lion's paws, and a hippo's body. Three of the, I think, most ferocious man-eating animals all in one go. That's yeah. why everyone was terrified of her. And yeah, and during your final exam, your heart was weighed against the feather, like you said, um, and it represented balance. And then if your heart didn't pass the exam, Amit would eat your essence, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, it's a little terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you, you wanted to keep a light heart and avoid that. There were some other requirements that the Egyptians had to have before they could enter the land of two fields. And that was that they had to have their name written down somewhere. Oh. And they had to preserve their body. Mm. And that's because they believed the soul split into two parts once they died. One part was called the bar, mm. which flew off every morning to keep watch over your living family and the other part was called the car. And I apologize if I'm butchering these Egyptian names. Yeah, no, same. I don't know what I'm saying and if I'm saying it correctly or not. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, but the car flew off to the land of two fields to enjoy the afterlife. And both the bar and the car returned each night to the tomb to sleep. Mm. If something, so the reason why the preserved body and the nameplate was so important was if something happened to your preserved body or your name was not written down, the bar and car could get lost along the way and you would just disappear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly didn't come across any of that. That's so interesting. I think they described that the bar was like your personality. It's mm. what made each person unique. Um, and it was a part of you that's not physical. It's like your humor, your warmth, your charm. Mm. I love your bar, Devin. Thank you. <laughs> and I yours. <laughs> and that was pictured in the hieroglyphics as a bird with a human head. Okay. And I think that's because Egyptians usually try to associate the animals uh, that they pick to depict things yeah. um, with what just what they observed from the animals in real life. And mm. they thought that birds were able to fly between um, the different worlds. Okay. And then, yeah, the car was, every ancient Egyptian was born with a car, which is pretty much your life force. Mm. Um, and that was represented in hieroglyphics by drawing a very little person mm. standing next to a picture of the same person just drawn much larger. Hmm. Like a little mini-me. <laughs> um, sometimes they were represented with their arms outstretched and that was to ward off evil. Okay. And yeah, when the person died, the car would continue to live forever. But it needed some nourishment mm. uh, that the person in the real, like normal life would need. And that's why Egyptians would paint pictures of food on the walls of the tombs mm. because they believed that the car didn't actually uh, eat the paintings, but it absorbed the life-giving force that the paintings represented. Hmm. So interesting. And yes, you. so you needed your nameplate, which was called, I believe, a cartouche? A cartouche? <laughs> I'm not sure. One of those two. <laughs> uh, and that was put on your coffin and it helped the barn car find you. Okay. And this is also why grave robbing was such a bad crime in Egypt. Oh. Um, it was like the worst crime you could do because um, grave, grave goods could be replaced, mm. but if they disrupted your preserved body, there was nothing your family could do and you'd be lost forever. So essentially they were stealing your eternity. That is so dark. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> That is heavy. <laughs> um, but one thing that, seeing as we were talking about like the mummification process and stuff as well, um, one thing that I found really interesting is the god um, Anubis, who was apparently the Egyptian god of mummification, Yes. Um, sort of was supposed to oversee the embalming process and help um, Egyptian souls find the hall of truth in the afterlife. Yes, that's because he actually was the first person to create a well, god, not person, uh, to create a mummy when he had to help stitched back together Osiris. Uh, Ooh, I have an interesting story about that. <laughs> Please do tell. Okay, wait. I have to like... I have to... Set the tone. Yeah. So, back in the day, when um, Osiris and Isis were married, they were actually brother and sister. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't. That's weird. Yeah, so they were husband and wife and also brother and sister. Um, and they ruled Egypt together until their brother Set... Uh, slayed Osiris and took his place. So after Osiris died, Isis refused to believe that he was gone. She wasn't having any of it and began to search Egypt for his body. 
Yeah, I know that she searched everywhere far and wide to just try and restore her husband. Yeah, because technically ISIS apparently, I mean, Set actually cut him up into like 42 pieces and spread him all over Egypt. Ooh. Yeah, so. That's doing a thorough job. <laughs> so Cyrus obviously wanted her husband back, went searching for all these pieces to put him back together, um, and she only found 41 pieces. And the one thing that was missing was his manhood. I <laughs> love <Lovely. laughs> So, you know, she was pretty devastated about this because her whole reason for wanting to bring him back was because she wanted to have a child. Um, so. She apparently created a new organ for her Frankenstein husband uh, and revived him long enough to get pregnant. And Osiris then went on to rule the underworld and their son Horus became Egypt's new ruler. Yes, from what I understand, they brought him back, but only partially. Mm. So he couldn't really be the ruler over Egypt that he yeah. was. And yeah, he went down to the underworld and he would judge every soul that passed his way. Okay, I don't know that part. <laughs> I just know that they brought him back sort of long enough for them to have a kid, basically. And that kid was Horus, I think. Yeah. Um, but going back to what started this whole thing, we're talking about Anubis. And, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Anubis liked to collect trophies from the people he embalmed. Oh, I didn't know that. Or the people that were embalmed. Mm -hmm. um, so when Set slayed Osiris, uh, he offered the gods organs to Anubis as a present. And for centuries, other Egyptians would offer pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. And that's why he also had the head of a jackal, because he would consume these oh. pieces of I people. also heard that the Egyptians would always see jackals running around the grave sites mm. and they just assumed that um, Anubis had chosen these as his sacred animal so that's ah. also another reason hmm. okay <laughs> yeah um, so well, we did mention it briefly earlier but grave goods let's come back to that mm. of course when you were going to the afterlife you needed some luggage you don't <laughs> want to arrive without things you know to make your afterlife more comfortable mm. Uh, so ancient Egyptians spent their whole lives actually um, preparing their grave goods. That's pretty dark, actually. <laughs> well, their whole life was fixated around this. True, yeah. Um, they believed that they'd be assigned jobs in the afterlife. So they would make these little clay figures, which would supposedly magically do the work for them in the afterlife so that they could just enjoy it. Okay. Um, they would also make things like toys, beautiful pieces of clothing, miniature pots and bowls, and anything else that they wanted. And it was actually quite custom to show everybody your grave goods before packing it away, and everybody would ooh and ah. Um, <laughs> it's a little boastful. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at this lovely tray of jewelry I'm taking with me to the afterlife. That's oh, lovely. They took that seriously. <laughs> and those would be packed into urns, and then it's like, packing luggage for a trip, mm. the urns would then be buried with them um, in their tombs. Yeah. Uh, spells were another thing that they had to prepare oh, okay. for their afterlife. Uh, I think often we'll hear about the Book of the Dead when talking about the ancient Egyptians. Um, it's not actually a book, it's a nickname for many magical spells that the ancient Egyptians would believed would work. Mm. Um, most were geared towards helping the Egyptians reach the afterlife safely. Uh, I think some were written on papyrus, others on tomb walls. Okay. But yeah, the more wealthy Egyptians would be able to hire scribes to write quite fancy, beautiful designs. Mm. Uh, those who weren't as wealthy or fortunate could buy ready-made uh, spells in the marketplace, and those would just have blank spaces where they could fill in their name. Okay. And the reason written spells were so... Um, helpful as well was there was another place to write your name down. Mm. And yeah, then you were pretty much, if you got your spells, you got your luggage, you <laughs> pretty much all set for the afterlife. Well, I heard that also um, a lot of times their servants would be ritualistically murdered and put Buried in their tombs with, with them. them. Yes, I've heard that too. But apparently this wasn't like a scary thing for them. It was almost like an honor to, you know, be... That's some heavy belief system there. Yeah, it said something about... Um, because of their obsession with life and death and the journey and everything, it was an honor to be able to serve your master in the afterlife as well. Um, but I still think it's kind of like 
scary to know yeah, that you're employed when, by this person. And when they die, you die. Yeah, that's it's not even scary. Not when my time's up, it's when your time's up, my time's up. Yeah, your fate is tied to your employer. That's crazy. Um, so I think a lot of people know the Egyptian mummification process was like quite um, thorough. There would be four priests, one would actually dress up as Anubis. Hmm. And all the inner organs would be removed from the body and um, put in jars. Then linen cloth and natron uh, were used as packaging to replace the oh, yeah. organs. Uh, I know they would pick the no- uh, the brain out through the nose using That's this charming. kind of hook. <laughs> um, then it would the body would have to be covered and placed on a tilted slab for 40 days mm. so that the body could drive any fluids. Uh, it would then get some <laughs> Devon's pulling faces here. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so gross. Um, yeah, to have a body lying out for 40 days, that's mm. quite... Mm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> then, then become the makeup phase. You All the packaging would be removed and the incision, incisions would be sewn up and the bo- body would be rubbed with oils and resins. The nostrils were stuffed with wax and pads were put in under the eyes to make them look full. I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would start with strips of linen around the body. Uh, they also put jewelry on to decorate the bodies as well as masks. Mm. And the masks obviously had to cover the face and that was so that the bar and car could recognize the body. Oh. And they were colored and made as lifelike as possible for that reason. Okay. And then comes the sarcophagus uh, where the mummy was placed in the coffin and uh, well, sometimes a series of coffins. I think you've seen these kind of like those Russian dolls, mm. um, one going into the next, into the next. And the nameplate was put on. Then there was a procession where family and friends uh, would stand by the final resting place and mourners would have to wail as the priests prayed at the tomb. Often mourners would be hired. It wasn't <gasps> even people who knew the person who departed. They were hired to stand there and wail. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's actually hilarious to me. And finally, the tomb door was sealed. That is... They hired people to pretend to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> that's horrible. And this whole process was, I think, quite an expensive one and elaborate one. So the poor would just put the uh, deceased bodies out into the desert and the sand would pretty much do the work that was done through the whole mummification process and it worked quite well. The, su- the sand and the sun, it would dry it out. That's weird though to me because I mean the whole process seems to be like a very elaborate one, very, you know, like strict and surely if you're so invested in it to so just throw a body out to like... Yeah, I also found that weird. I know not everyone could afford it but it's strange there to me was that there wasn't... A, there was such a cultural mm. group that does just seem a bit breaking the yeah. system. Um, but speaking of like mummification and stuff like that, there was actually a trend in Europe in the 1600s, 1700s, mm. where um, they were crushing up mummy remnants, <laughs> putting them in potions. That's absolutely disgusting. Yeah, it was, it was, no! to, <laughs> it was to treat any kind of like ailment, you know, they were um, apparently crushing up mummies, claiming that it could cure all sorts oh, of different that makes things. Me feel so sick. But I mean, it went further than that. It wasn't exclusively just mummies. They were apparently drinking blood to cure blood-related diseases and crushing up skulls to help with problems with the brain. I think they have massive problems with the brain. <laughs> the star. Well, clearly the skull juice wasn't working. <laughs> oh, that's really gross. I did actually hear something about that the other day where they had just discovered uh, uh, several uh, mummy cases and the archaeologists wanted to drink the fluids that were in the cases. I read about that. For some that. reason, that like disgusting. what you mentioned. <laughs> it really is. It turns my stomach so much. I can't imagine ever getting to a thought process where I would contemplate doing that. Yeah, like what makes you open up a sarcophagus or whatever and be like, hmm, I wonder what that would that. taste like. <laughs> <laughs> but there was actually also this like fad at one point in Europe where mummies were imported to be like unwrapped at parties. It was like a thing. Yeah, oh, weird people out in this world, man. Like, yeah. So they were like, yeah, they were being illegally smuggled out of Egypt, and it was so super disrespectful. Obviously, I'm not kidding. But people were just getting their hands on these mummies and unwrapping them at parties and. 
<laughs> At one point, getting hold of mummy bandages was really, really cheap. Um, and sometimes even cheaper than paper. So there was one guy in the 1900s in the United States that figured he could save money wrapping food by buying <laughs> mummy bandages, so used gross. ones. gross. So he would package the food in that and a couple months or weeks later, whatever, his plan clearly failed because people started catching cholera. Oh, it failed, really. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> From wrapping your food in mummy wrappings. That's, what is wrong with people? <laughs> I, I try not to think too hard about that question. <laughs> oh. uh -uh. But as we've said, that's that's that may be for everyone on Earth where the journey ends, but for these souls, that is not where the journey ended. That was just the beginning of a journey for them. Mm. Uh, once the deceased had gone through their life and um, passed away, they would have to travel through the underworld. Mm. And well, their spirit would, and they would have to contend with gods and strange creatures and gatekeepers in order to reach Osiris and the Hall of Judgment, mm. uh, where they would have to plead their case for entry into the afterlife. So this is on top of having their heart weighed. That comes next, actually. That oh, happens okay. in the Hall of Judgment. So, like you said, uh, once they reached that point, um, the deceased had to. It, 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 the the judgment process involved two parts. Mm. Uh, this was in the realm of Duat, and which is pretty much just the realm of the gods, or the land of the gods. And first of all, they had to pass through seven gates, reciting accurate uh, magic spell at each one. Mm. And I think that is where they would land with standing oath. They would first have to stand before 42 divine judges um, and plead innocence on any wrongdoing that they did in their lifetime. Uh, the Book of Dead that they had actually, uh, the, the spells that they purchased would also help them choose the correct words for each judge, mm. um, which would just help ensure that they would pass the judgment, even if they weren't completely guilt-free. Okay. Um, and yes, then came the weighing of the heart ceremony, where the heart contained, your heart supposedly contained a record of all uh, th actions that you did in life. Mm and it was weighed against a feather from the goddess Ma'at and the, I think her she symbolized justice and truth mm. um, and it would the feather would determine if the deceased had been virtuous or not if your heart was light as we mentioned before you try to make your heart as light as possible by doing good deeds mm. if it was light the scale would balance with the feather and you could pass through if the heart wasn't light and it uh, outweighed the feather. As you mentioned, a mutt would step in. Hmm. Or a mutt. Um, and she would, I think, move. Uh, they said she would move so quickly and she would devour the essence. That's so scary. <laughs> but actually, speaking of that and talking about weighing the heart and stuff, I don't, I don't know, maybe there's another explanation, but that sort of reminds me of how the justice system and law and stuff uses the scale as a symbol. That's what I see in my mind when yeah. I talk about this, actually. So I wonder if that's, like, connected in any way. Probably derived from. Hmm. And yes, if they got through all of that, they would land in the field of rushes, which was, as I said, a reflection of the real world. It would have blue skies and rivers and boats and gods and goddesses. This is, I think, a realm where you would live on the same basis as they were gods in your world now. Mm. Um, and yeah, there were fields and crops all needing plowing and harvesting. And the dead were sort of granted these plots of land by the gods, which mm. they had to care for and harvest. Uh, <laughs> but this is where those little clay dolls come in. You could get your little magical clay dolls to come in and do the work for you. Uh, so that you can go and sit under a tree and enjoy the afterworld. I was about to say, like, you know, you expect the afterlife to be the place where you can relax. <laughs> I don't want to be doing manual labor after I've passed on. So yeah, go for the clay dolls. <laughs> Definitely bring a couple of those along. Um, one thing that I found really interesting as well, as aside from having your servants killed with you, you could also, they would take your, your pets, your cats with you. I didn't apparently. know that. Yeah, there was apparently also... Um, a goddess or a god named Bastet. Yes. Um, who people would bring mummified cats to her in her temple. And in the 1880s, I believe, ar uh, archaeologists excavated her temple and uncovered more than 300,000 mummified cats. Oh, my word. I know cats were a very big part of the Egyptian culture because they would kill 
um, like rats and it was just a whole lot of things that the Egyptians found to be very yeah, I also nasty. heard. Yeah, I heard that they'd mummify the cats as well and put them with. So I think they too. were seen as a form of protection. And mm. stuff, but that's interesting. Jeez, no, nobody got off in Egypt. <laughs> if somebody died, yeah, no. there's a whole hit line after that. Yeah, I know. But like the thing is with the Egyptian culture and like their stories, there is so much there and really so many is. interesting stories. It's such a rich culture. I've always loved it from when I was small. There are so many interesting uh, stories about that. I'm not going to lie, when I was reading through all of the stuff, it, a lot of these like stories about the gods and goddesses sounded like the best idea for a CW TV series. I like, was wondering that last <laughs> night. I was like, why has nobody made this into some kind of TV series or show? It's uh, the, Their stories and just their life is so interesting. It's. I think like the closest is probably American Gods, but that sort of spans a whole bunch of different, yeah, uh, different ideas and stuff. But I think it would make a freaking awesome show. Yeah, somebody should tap into that. That's, that's CW a good business <laughs> business right there. The CW needs to get in on that. But um, guys, if you want to read more about this, I suggest you go online because, like I said, there are thousands of stories. Highly recommend it. And yeah, it's we probably one in a line of us being able to explore different cultures and regions view of death and the afterlife yeah no so definitely go check it out for yourself and maybe leave us a comment on facebook or on youtube which is where we're where we're situated <laughs> um so you can find us on there under blended podcasts uh, also check out our instagram we're also blended podcasts on there i believe leave us a comment let us know what you think about the fun facts of ancient egyptian culture and yeah, join us next week. We have some very interesting tales of the ocean and sea to tell you. Oh yes, it's going to be really exciting, so make sure you tune in. Freaky Fridays, hosted by Devin Beatty and Megan Portnoy, and produced with the generous assistance of Yanu Blau and Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio.